Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Aaron Blade, and I'm the editor, creator, and producer of what you're watching right now, Blade Talk. If you are new here, welcome, and you find this presentation helpful and informative, do me a huge favor and hit that like button, do me an even greater favor and subscribe to my channel. Always appreciate all the support that I'm giving. Today, I want to answer a question from one of you, my viewers. Um, they sent me an email today, actually, and it states the following. Hey Blade, I had a few questions about episode 144 about Jesus' resurrection. I agree with you that there are inconsistencies in the Bible about the resurrection, but doesn't that make the event that more believable? Imagine if the every gospel said the same thing. You'd say that there is a conspiracy and or plagiar plagiar claim plagiarism. Also, Paul got a revelation from Jesus himself, not a man. See Galatians chapter 1 verse 12. How was it that Paul was able to state the same things about Jesus that the early Christians did? Lastly, why would the early church historians allow these inconsistencies within the New Testament itself? Very good questions. Um, I wanted to answer this one in particular because... I see some of the the emails that I get in response to presentations that I do. I see the comments from time to time. I don't go through all of them. And, you know, a lot of people make blanket statements, right? I'll give a presentation and it's very easy to sit back behind a freaking keyboard and say, oh, I could easily answer all those questions and I can easily sum up this or you need the Holy Spirit or, you know, the, the you got to have faith or whatever the case may be. This particular viewer um, actually cites Galatians chapter 1 verse 12 to support their, their, their question, right? So I love that, right? I love the exchange and dialogue. But when someone makes the claim, oh, I could easily answer this or that, or, you know, um, you know, you need the Holy Spirit or whatever the case may be, I can't I can't operate off of that, right? But when someone actually quotes from the the, the Quran or the Torah or um, the New Testament, right? then I can actually engage and actually maybe even learn something from you, right? But so many people shy away from it, you know, when they just, oh, I could answer that, but I just don't want to. No, you're lying. You can't answer it, you know, but I digress. That being said, um, these are some good, good questions, and I'd be happy to um, answer them to the best of my ability. Let's begin. All right, so the first thing I'm going to address is the recap of 144. I gave episode 144, I gave many um, inconsistencies, contradictions that I found to be problematic with the resurrection account of Jesus, right? So to make a long story short, right? Um, Mark's gospel account of the risen Jesus you know, if you read the Gospel of Mark, in terms of the risen Jesus, it doesn't inspire joy or faith, right? Um, quite the contrary, actually. It, it, it inspires fear and bewilderment and silence, right? Moreover, Jesus never even appears, right? As time goes on in Matthew's Gospel, Luke's Gospel, then John's Gospel, um, the story becomes much more let's say, richer, um, taking on a variety of new details that often seem aimed at correcting the starkness of Mark's gospel, right? In short, the further away from in time from the alleged event 
that took place that Sunday morning, the more richly detailed the story becomes. All right. Um, so when historians look for events that took place, they do so by contemporary sources that corroborate with one another and are consistent with one another. Okay. Um, with respect to Jesus, the New Testament, even if you want to call it a contemporary source, even if I grant um, that premise, are absolutely not consistent with one another, right? Um, so, in fact, among the Gospels, they're, they're astoundingly inconsistent, all right? Um, let's look into uh, where the disciples seen the risen Jesus. For example, in Matthew and Mark's Gospel, an angel instructs women, they can't even agree on how many women there are, but an angel instructs women to tell the disciples that Jesus will be appearing to them um, up north in Galilee, okay? I'm quoting Mark chapter 16, verse 7. Quote, Go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he said to you. End quote. Matthew chapter 28, verse 7. Quote, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. End quote. Matthew goes even further and has Jesus appearing in chapter 28, verse 10, and saying, go take word to my brethren, brethren and leave for Galilee. Okay, telling the females, um, Jesus actually appears himself and tells the females to go tell his brethren to go. You need to go to Galilee and, you know, uh, there uh, I will meet them. Jesus will meet them, right? Now, keep in mind that where Jesus was executed and buried was Jerusalem, okay? Um, when you look into Galilee, Galilee was 70 miles, around 70 miles north of Jerusalem, all right? And there is no subway. There are no taxis back then. This is straight by camel or donkey or walking, all right? Horses. Um, 70 miles north. 70 miles, okay? How long do you think it will take to get from one place 70 miles away with no, you know, uh, vehicle and what have the modern technology, right? I digress. Um, so then we get to Luke's gospel, has Jesus appearing to his disciples, um, quote, that very day in Jerusalem, end quote, Luke chapter 24, verse 13. All right. He sees them again in Bethany, which is outside of Jerusalem, uh, where he, quote, departed from them, end quote. Luke says nothing about Galilee. Like, keep in mind, Luke chapter one, verse two states that um, whoever the author of Luke is stated that he observed things very carefully, end quote. Um, so in Luke's gospel, um, you know, mentions nothing about uh, Galilee at all, all right? In fact, Luke's gospel, Jesus commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. See Acts chapter 1, verse 4, right? So, Matthew commanded them to leave Jerusalem, while Luke's gospel, or the author of Acts chapter 1, verse 4, commanded them not to to leave Jerusalem. So which one is it, right? John's gospel also avoids the whole go to Galilee Jesus thing, right? On Sunday evening, John uh, has appeared, John's gospel has Jesus appearing to his disciples behind locked doors for, quote, fear of the Jews. I don't know what it is about John's gospel that he just has it out for the Jews. But in any event, um, this is chapter John chapter 20, verse 
19. John's gospel states that Jesus doesn't reveal himself in Galilee until Jesus's third appearance. Okay, this is John chapter 21, verse 14. So for those of us keeping score, okay, Matthew's uh, Jesus tells disciples to leave Jerusalem and to go to Galilee. Okay, Jesus's first appearance is on a mountain in Galilee. That's Matthew's gospel. Okay, Luke's Jesus makes all of his appearances in or around Jerusalem, never Galilee. Jesus, in fact, tells his disciples not to leave Jerusalem. All right. John's Jesus makes his first and second appearance in Jerusalem. His third appearance is in Galilee on a beach, on a beach. Now, Matthew's gospel mentions Galilee and Jesus appearing on a mountain. John's gospel, it's the third appearance and it's not on a mountain, it's on a beach. One doesn't need to be a professional historian to see that there's not much historians have to work with here, okay? These are not sources that corroborate with one another, but rather they essentially contradict each other, all right? Now, the viewer raised a second point. I love this because it is, um, he gave me, he or she uh, gave me uh, uh citations, right? Gave me sources. Love it. All right. So let's get into Paul. Okay. The viewer mentions uh, that the idea that Paul and the early Christians had the same message. So that should be sufficient evidence that there's a good chance that it is true. Now, let's be clear. I don't dispute the fact that a man named Jesus existed um, or that a man named Jesus, that same Jesus, ended up being crucified, okay? I don't dispute that. The controversy lies in the resurrection account. Why? Because Paul states in Romans chapter 1 verse 4, quote, by his resurrection that Jesus declared to be the Son of God, end quote. So by Jesus' resurrection, Jesus is the Son of God, according to Paul chapter 1 verse 4. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14, Paul characterizes Jesus' resurrection as the sine qua non of uh, the Christian faith. Without it, the faith is worthless. I agree with Paul, right? And it is not something that I often say, so note it well, all right? Um, so... Essentially, yes, uh, the viewer mentioned Galatians chapter 1 verse uh, 12 is actually 11 and 12 that Paul, quote, neither received the gospel from man, nor was it taught to him, but he received it by revelation of Jesus Christ, end quote. A remarkable claim indeed. Does it ring true? No. Is it corroborated with other Christian sources? Absolutely not. Quite the opposite, actually. Okay. Paul notes in Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, that he used to persecute the church, right? Now, when we first meet Paul in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7, uh, for those of us that are keeping track and needing the references as we go along, um, I'm at Acts chapter 7. He just listened to a lengthy disposition by a Christian deacon named Stephen. Then Stephen is murdered, stoned to death. Now, as persecuted of the church, now as persecutor of the church, Paul must have essentially heard the message or the gospel that they were preaching, right? Almost immediately after Paul's dramatic um, experience on the road to Damascus, Paul is in the company of early Christians, right? A little bit of ironic, isn't it? First, he meets Ananias, who according to Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 18, Jesus sent to Paul, okay? Ananias preaches the gospel to Paul, and Paul is baptized, 
Paul goes directly to the disciples who were at Damas- who were in Damascus and began immediately proclaiming Jesus. Paul didn't receive the gospel from any human being. If that is true, then the author of Acts got the story horribly wrong because Acts has Paul getting the message and or gospel from a whole slew of human beings. All right. Now, who do we believe here? Paul in Galatians or the author of Acts? It can't be both. At least one of them have to be wrong. All right. So you tell me. Now, the next point was why would early church historians put these books in the Bible that weren't consistent? Indeed, they did. Um, They put the Bible together, not acting as historians, but as leaders of the church that wanted to push um, a certain agenda, right? A specific agenda. You have to understand that for the four Gospels uh, have Jesus's mentioned Jesus's resurrection, right? And to some extent, to some that is consistent enough, right? You have four Gospels that that tell a story about a man rising from the dead, right? And to many Christians, that's enough. That's it. Four accounts, and they all witness the same thing, right? Until one gets deeper into the story, because that's where the consistencies end, right? Um, So, an accumulation of inconsistencies reduces the probability that a story is true, okay? At the very least, it negatively impacts the story's credibility, All right. So here's the thing. I was a cop in the military. Right. True story. I was a cop in the United States Air Force. Okay. From time to time, when I would arrive on the scene um, of someone committing a violation or something like that, I had to um, we had to take witness statements. Right. Um, To essentially support and corroborate the violation that was taking place, that had taken place, right? When I did so, I listened very carefully to the witness statements and compared them in my head to other witness statements, all right? Um, When inconsistencies started to emerge, now I have a problem on my hands, If there is enough inconsistencies, then I don't even have much to go on at all, right? So, it's always funny how, you know, many Christians have gotten it in their head that inconsistencies somehow make a story more credible, right? It is interesting because they seem to walk down both sides of the street, right? On one hand... um, They claim that the Gospels are not inconsistent or disagree with one another. And on the other, they say that, well, inconsistencies make a story more believable, right? I digress. Um, Let me assure you that inconsistencies make a story less credible, all right? Um... There is an inverse effect from the number of inconsistencies to the credibility of a story. Okay, for example, I was, co- I was a cop in the military. If I arrived on a scene and there was a call that a man stabbed a person, threw him in the back of his vehicle, and then drove off. Okay, now. I, as a cop, arrive on the scene where it took place, okay? So, of course, what do I have? I mean, the perpetrator um, essentially stabbed someone and threw them in their vehicle and drove off, okay? All I have are um, the witness statements, right? Anybody see anything, right? So, I talked to four individuals, okay? Four individuals. The first one states that... 
Um, the stabbing took place on the 10th floor of a building. Then that man essentially took the, the person at knife point all the way into the, all the way down the, the, to the first floor of the building, put them in their vehicle and drove off. Another witness states that, um, the, the, it, it happened in the basement. Okay. The, the perpetrator stabbed someone in the basement, held him at knife point, and then drug him all the way to, uh, his vehicle, put him in the vehicle, and drove off. All right. The third witness states that it happened in a completely different building from the first and second witness. All right. The fourth witness states that it actually happened out on the street. He quickly stabbed him and then threw him in the vehicle and then drove off. These differences, differences aren't making the claim that someone got stabbed any more credible at all. In fact, it's happening. It's having the opposite effect. Now me as a cop, I feel like I'm on a goose chase, right? I'm chasing a ghost at this point. One witness says that, you know, they were drug out to, you know, from the 10th floor all the way down to the first and then put in the vehicle and drove off. Second one states that second witness states that it happened in the basement and then carried him upstairs, put him in a vehicle, drove off. Third witness states that didn't even happen in the same building as what the first and second witness are stating. And then the fourth witness is stating that it happened down on the street. What am I supposed to do with that, right? So that's the issue that I have with the New Testament itself. The thing is, is... All of them agree that Jesus rose from the dead, but they can't, th that's where the similarities end in terms of Jesus's resurrection. That's where it ends. They can't agree on who actually found the tomb empty. They can't agree on who Jesus appeared to. They can't agree on where Jesus was, right? Now, consider this, you know, and that at that time, you know, that's like, you know, um, in today's time from Chicago to New York, from uh, Jerusalem to Galilee, right? They couldn't even decide where or agree upon where Jesus had risen, right? These are inconsistencies that are so large that it essentially hurts the, the whole event that took place, allegedly took place, right? So that being said, I hope I've answered uh, the question in its totality. I don't want to make sure I didn't, didn't miss anything. Um, talked about Paul. Um, I talked about the, the church leaders. Um, you know, they, they had an agenda to push, right? Um, and here's the thing. I talk about other faiths and whatnot. It's not to be uh, divisive or anything like that. I'm not sitting here proselytizing and saying, you need to be Jewish. You need to be, that's not my goal at all. My goal is to get everyone to essentially wake up and think about it. Most Christians, um, Muslims, and even Jews, most of us are only Christians, Muslims, and Jews, or whatever, Hindus, Buddhists, because their parents were. And what do I consistently say on this channel? All I want you to do is think. Think. Think for yourself. I'm not saying, you know, you need to contact a rabbi. You need to be Jewish. Be Jewish. Be... I'm not proselytizing to anyone. I'm saying think. 
think. And we can exchange in a healthy dialogue, right? Because you could essentially teach me something. And if I'm wrong, I've never had an, an issue admitting that I'm wrong. But typically, all I get is the, oh, you're stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. Do, do some more research. Do some more homework. Or, you know, I could answer them if I, if I wanted to. If I, if I really wanted to dive in, I could answer. Really? Well, if you're a Christian, you're commanded to. That's your job. Jesus literally says, the Gospel of Matthew, go forth to the non-Jews, the Gentiles, and preach to them, telling them the good words, the, the good news, which is what gospel essentially means. You are commanded to do so. But alas, in, a, in my lifetime, you know, the ones that have stepped up, I commend, I respect. This viewer will always have my respect. You know, you cite sources and and whatnot, you know, hey, I, I, at the very least, you earn my respect more than, you know, the, the people that make the claim that, oh, well, I, I could, but I don't want to, you know, yeah, you're scared. Don't allow my confidence to affect your insecurity or your lack of knowledge in your own belief system, right? So that being said, you know, I hope you learned something from this presentation. Um, again, I'm not trying to tell everybody to be Jewish. I'm saying that, you know, just think about what it is that you believe. If you're fine being a Christian, then being Christian. If you're fine being a Muslim, be a Muslim. If you're fine being, as long as you're a good person, I have no issue. I have no issue at all. But in my experience, the way that you, you're able to attain wisdom is by having your viewpoint challenged, right? Don't run away from it. Don't shy away from it or whatever the case may be. The way that you know, you uh, accumulate more knowledge and wisdom is someone comes along and makes you think and makes you go back to the drawing board and find out, okay, how do I, how do I see this and how can I maneuver it? Right. And then come back and then let me know. Right. I'm always, you know, interested in dialogue and whatnot. And, it comes from me being Jewish and have that Jewish background. You know, I have sat up here and debated um, atheists and Christians and Muslims and even a Hindu once, right? Um, I love, I love it because you learn so much. I'm not debating to, you know, you need to become Jewish. No, I'm debating to gain more knowledge. And gain more wisdom right so at least i can understand you know from your point of view right but so many people don't want to actually think they just ah oh, well you, you gotta have faith you know and and you you um you know the the holy spirit it just hasn't touched you yet right I concentrate more so on the fact that I believe that through healthy communication, we can achieve peace, right? I don't always have to agree. We're never going to always agree, right? But if we can disagree and still exchange and dialogue, that's what I value. And shout out to my subscribers and viewers that do disagree with certain things that I've said in the past on my channel. But yet you're still here rocking with me, listening to me. That being said, thank you all so much for watching this presentation. If you found it helpful, informative, again, 
do me a huge favor and hit that like button. Do me an even greater favor and subscribe to my channel. I always appreciate all the support that I am given. Be good to yourselves. Be good to others. And until the next episode, you all take care.